Well, welcome everyone. How you doing, Bay Area? All right, how about that extra hour of sleep last night? That was so, that was so bad. Come on, act like you really enjoyed that extra hours of sleep. How are you guys doing this morning? You enjoyed that extra hour of sleep? All right, there you go. That makes me feel better. Well, uh, my name is Brent Squires. I'm the student ministry pastor here at Bay Area. And uh, I just want to give a special shout out to all those at our Easton campus and all those at our Odenton campus. As you know, this is Odenton's first Sunday back meeting in purpose. We knew this day would come and we're so excited for you guys. Uh, I'm thrilled today to be sharing with you uh, in this series called Set Free. And uh, before we do anything else, will you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Well, Father God, uh, we thank you for this time to be here, to worship together uh, in person. And for those uh, online, Lord Jesus, we just gather our hearts together around your word. We thank you for your word. And we, um, Lord, we expect that it's going to change us today. We expect that it's going to do something in our lives to draw us one step closer to you. We thank you for that in advance. In the name of Jesus, amen. So uh, I asked Jesus into my heart when I was five years old, and I believed because that prayer was sincere, because uh, I really meant that in my heart, I can still remember that today, Um, I believe that if I would have died, I would have gone to heaven based on my sincerity in that prayer, and that Jesus really came into my life at, at that young age. Uh, later, when I was 12, my, uh, my dad uh, planted a church and pastored there for 20 years. So I grew up a PK, a, a pastor's kid. Um, and I was taught, like many of you, that the most important aspect of my life was a relationship with Jesus. Can I get an amen? That was the most important thing of my life. I was taught that from a very young age, and I still believe that. Uh, but somewhere in my uh, youth and immaturity, it was probably because uh, I didn't have a fully developed frontal lobe yet uh, during those years, um, I equated being good and doing good things to having a relationship with Jesus and being made right or being justified in Jesus. Uh, and I thought that because I didn't drink, uh, I didn't smoke, I didn't do drugs, I didn't run around with the wrong crowd, that that was what God wanted uh, from me. And so I was kind of earning points with him and I was staying in his good graces. I thought that because I went to church and I came from a Christian home, my dad was a professional Christian, uh, that that made me a follower of Jesus. Um, And I thought that because I didn't watch rated R movies, uh, because I was baptized, because when I went to church, just like we'll do later today, uh, I took communion um, and I grew up serving from a very young age in the church. And because of all that, in my mind, I thought I was earning my way, earning my way to heaven. Um, But what I failed to understand, what I didn't recognize then, it took me several years, was that what really mattered the most to God was my relationship with him. None of those things that I had done um, had, had really counted at all towards my salvation. They were good things. They weren't bad things, but they didn't count towards my salvation. Um, Jesus wanted a relationship with me, but all along, I wasn't passionately pursuing that. Like I said, if I would have died, you know, I, at any point during that time, I would have gone to heaven, but I didn't spend every day of my life walking in relationship with him. Uh, I focused on doing the right things and not doing the wrong things. Um, After high school, I went to a Christian college, and um, at that Christian college, there were a lot of rules. Now, out of respect to my Christian college, I'm not going to give you any clue as to what Christian college that was, Um, but here are some of the do's and don'ts. So we had a very strict dress code at that time. It was shirt and pants, you know, tie, you know, all that type of thing. Uh, Hair length requirements that were checked regularly. And if you violated them, there was, there were penalties. Uh, Separate girl and guy dorms. So my freshman year at this Christian college was the first year that guys and girls were allowed to hold hands on campus. Woohoo. Yeah. Big year for us. Prior to that, girls and guys weren't even allowed to hold hands on campus. Um, There was no drinking. There was no dancing. There was no gambling. There was no secular music. And Church, require, church was a requirement. It was mandatory Sunday school, Sunday morning service, Sunday night uh, service, Wednesday night, hall meetings, the whole nine yards. Now, there wasn't anything you know, wrong with, with any of these kind of rules or anything like that. But while I was at school, all those do's and don'ts just kind of reinforced in me and in my mind that really I was kind of earning my way to heaven. I was kind of staying in God's good graces by doing or not doing a lot of those things. Now, 
as an adult, I look back on my Christian school and I'm, I, I get why they were doing all that. You can't have that many 18 to 22 year olds in a, in a tight area without having lots of rules and regulations. I get that and I appreciate what they were trying to do. So much so that I sent one of my own kids to that school as well. And now he's there. That wasn't a punishment. That was actually his choice. Um, but I just didn't get the connection while I was there of relationship with Jesus. It was really about religion for me and not as much about relationship. And I own the fact that that was wrong thinking and I get that now. Uh, Perhaps some of you here today have that same viewpoint in your life. Uh, Maybe, um, you know, you've been a follower of, of Jesus, but you've been more focused on doing the right things or not doing the wrong things in your life. Uh, things like going to church, reading your Bible, tithing or giving offerings, uh, making confession for your sins or being baptized. Maybe you've tried to focus on not doing the wrong things in your life. Things like not using or abusing substance, uh, staying away from pornography or rated R movies or not shopping on Sundays, always honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy or not eating meat on a Friday. Things like that maybe have been your focus Let's not do these things or let's try to do other things. Um, You know, perhaps you're even feeling that way today, some of you. And like me, years ago, your focus is much more on the do's and don'ts of forms of religion rather than the rich relationship that we just sang about in some of these songs up here that Jesus wants us to embrace. But what if I told you that God wanted something so much different from maybe what you've thought in the past. He wants so much more out of you than just following a list of stringent do's and don'ts and rules and regulations. What if I told you that God loved you and all of us so much that he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life here on earth, to die on the cross, to be the substitute for your sins, to justify you and to put you in a right standing with God? What if I told you all of that? Now, What I'm talking about today is about how God has provided us with incredible freedom. We're going to call it gospel freedom, and we'll unpack that in just a few minutes. But if I told you that all of this was true and all of this was available for you today, perhaps you might think it was totally worth getting up, getting dressed, coming to church, and engaging for another like 20 minutes or so as we dig into God's word. Now, If you're just joining us today, we're in this series called Set Free, and we're looking at the New Testament book of Galatians, uh, and it's written by a guy named Paul. And um, Paul, whose name was originally Saul, has this, um, well, at one time he was, man, he was a really bad sinner. I mean, he says so himself, that he was the worst of all sinners out there. Um, He literally killed Christians for a living. But uh, at one point, he has this incredible encounter with the post-resurrected Jesus, and it changes everything about his life. And he goes on from there, and he becomes the greatest uh, missionary, evangelist, church planner of the New Testament, probably of all time. So Paul, when we use this term uh, gospel freedom, and as Paul writes to the church, uh, the Galatians, man, he's an authority on this. His, His testimony, his story gives him credibility to speak to the Galatians back then and to you and to me today. Now in Galatians, he's writing to a church and the church is made up of men and women who uh, who have found freedom in Jesus. They have found a relationship in Jesus. But there's... Um a pressure and kind of they're being persuaded by false teachers to follow something other than the true gospel. Actually, Paul uses the term to return to slavery, the slavery of sin before they had met Jesus, where they're following a bunch of the religious rules and regulations and do's and don'ts of their time. Now, the Galatians were Gentiles and they were converted to Christianity but they, uh, they'd been totally misled by this group of people called the Judaizers uh, into thinking that, um, you know, if they fell in line with the Jewish customs, the, the, the law he refers to it as, that, so basically the Ten Commandments, not just the Ten Commandments, but it even gets expanded beyond that. And there's this false teaching that if you just follow all these Jewish laws and customs, that that plus Jesus, you know, gets you salvation. And man, that is totally false. There is no Jesus plus. It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. So that's all false that Paul is uh, telling them about. Paul's message to the Galatians can really be summed up in the phrase, it's about freedom. He wants them to know more than anything that having a relationship with Jesus, being a follower of Jesus, 
in this new thing, the church, it's all about freedom, gospel freedom. And that's where Paul begins in Galatians chapter five. And that's where we began this morning. Now, uh, in these, uh, I'm only kind of going to quickly go through the first 15 verses and not really spend a lot of time uh, on, except, except maybe one or two of them, two of the verses. But uh, there's a lot here. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to focus kind of on a, a big idea so that we could come away with kind of this large uh, overarching concept that Paul gives us in these first 15 verses. So let's look at this big idea for a minute. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you in this big idea, kind of the whole summary of my message, just in case there's somebody out there and you're just now realizing that this guy on stage is a youth pastor, he's not a real pastor, and you're thinking like, let's slip out of here, you know, because he doesn't know what he's talking about. So really, if you don't remember anything else at all, here's the big idea, and it's this. Gospel freedom takes away the guilt of sin and it eats away at the motivation to sin. I'll read it one more time. Gospel freedom takes away the guilt of sin and it eats away at the motivation to sin. So in this big idea, it addresses two types of tensions that I know I felt and perhaps you've felt them as well um, because they do exist. And the first one is this. For some, it's the, uh, the tension uh, that uh, we probably been, a number of us have probably been living with perhaps a good bit of our lives, even our post-salvation, our post-acceptance of Jesus' lives. It's the mindset where we have to maintain the, all the do's and don'ts, perhaps that we've been taught all along the way of religion in order to win our favor with God. And what Paul's saying here is that gospel freedom totally takes that tension away, totally takes that mindset away, totally debunks that whole concept. And secondly, for others, there's a tension where you're confusing or perhaps in the past you've confused gospel freedom uh, and you've kind of thought, well, with this freedom comes this ability to live however I would like to live. So I can go out and sin. I can do whatever I want. I can live whatever way I want to live. And all I got to do is just pray Jesus will forgive me. It won't, it won't matter. So there's these two tensions that kind of get brought out in these passages of scripture. Here's the thing. Both of these tensions, both of these mindsets are wrong. Neither one of them is what Jesus died for and neither offer you gospel freedom that Paul's talking about in Galatians. So either one of those mindsets, totally not what Jesus died for. So let's unpack the first part. Gospel freedom takes away the guilt of sin. It takes away the guilt of sin. Galatians chapter five, verse one. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject to a yoke of slavery. So Galatians 5.1 tells us two things. Number one, we have freedom in Jesus. Amen. We have tremendous freedom in Jesus. But number two, that freedom can be taken away. That freedom can be taken away. Now, I didn't say salvation. Don't hear me wrong. I didn't say salvation can be taken away. Paul's not saying you can lose your salvation, but he is saying that your freedom can be taken away. We'll get there in just a second. So number one, we have freedom in Jesus. We have freedom in Jesus. Everything about the gospel, everything about the gospel, everything about what Paul's telling to the, to the Galatians here is pointing towards freedom in Jesus. Paul later uh, in, in, in the book of Romans will tell us in, in chapter eight, verse one and two, he says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. That's good news. We don't have to be bogged down by, by our past. Paul is saying that uh, if we just accept the forgiveness of our sins that Jesus offered us, then we should move on from our sins. We shouldn't get bogged down and in going back into to our sins from yesterday and the days gone by. We shouldn't be, feel the guilt and the, the, the shame and, and the condemnation of sins from our past. We should feel the freedom that Jesus brings us. Uh, and not get bogged down. In the book of Proverbs, um, and, and Paul used this word about being, the Galatians were being foolish because they were going back to that guilt and shame. And he calls them foolish at one point. And, and it made me think of a proverb where, uh, and, and one proverb, I think it's Proverbs 26, it says, a fool is like a, a dog who returns to its vomit. A dog who returns to its vomit. Any dog owners out there? Any dog owners? So if you have a dog, I have a dog, you know exactly what I'm talking about. A dog will return to its vomit. Actually, um, my dog, uh, Fletch, uh, is a pit bull. And he, he's not the sharpest dog. He's not the sharpest dog in the world. Um, 
Man, and he's an eater. Most dogs are, but he loves just to, he's a chewer, he's an eater. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was my daughter's 19th birthday, and for her birthday, my mother-in-law gave us a cake. My daughter doesn't even like cake, but my mother-in-law gave us this cake, and uh, it was sitting on the table. We were going to cut up the cake that night, and uh, the, table was, uh, the cake was sitting on the table in one of those pink, like, bake cake, uh, pink cake boxes, and I'm cutting through the kitchen, and I see the box sitting on the table, and the lid is over it, and I'm thinking, we're going to have cake in just a little while, and then I see Fletch sitting on the ground, and I hear his stum- stomach just rumbling. And I'm like, man, Fletch is wanting the cake too. He's starving for the cake as well. And he's drooling. He's got this incredible amount of drool just coming out of his mouth. And we've had him for six years. Even I'd never seen him drool that much. And, um, and he's looking kind of weird. So I go to leave the kitchen and I stop and I look back and I go over to the cake box and I just flip the lid of the box open. And this is what's in the box. <laughs> this is what's in my box. And then... Uh, it actually took me a second. This is how sharp I am. It actually, I actually thought, did the kids eat all the cake? <laughs> but then I realized, man, my kids, they do not know how to cut cake. <laughs> then I look back and this is what I see right next to the table. I see Fletch just sitting there staring. So I quick pulled out my phone and I took that picture. Cake was totally gone. So then I had to keep an eye on Fletch. And I actually told him, I was like, look, Fletch, we're not having second dessert later. Like, <laughs> so, you know, a dog will return to its vomit. So here's the deal. Enjoy the freedom from sin that Jesus died to give you. Don't go back to the guilt and the condemn- condemnation and shame of your past sins. Don't do that. If you do, Paul says, you're foolish. You're foolish. But although we have found freedom in Jesus, that freedom, as I said, it can be lost. And again, I didn't say salvation can be lost, but I'm talking about the freedom that comes with salvation that Jesus died to give us. And Paul tells the Galatians to to stand firm, stand firm in this promise that you have freedom, stand firm in the salvation, in the freedom that Jesus uh, died to give us and stand firm against the false teachers who would tell you that salvation comes from following all of the laws, all these Jewish customs and all the 10 commandments and all of that. And Paul tells the Galatians that if they fall into these false teachings and go back to trying to keep the law and uphold the Ten Commandments, that will actually make them lose the freedom that Jesus died to give them. And why is that? Because the law, well, the law is a lag measure. It can only point out the fact that you can't keep the law, that you can't uphold all the laws. It's just like a blaring sign saying you can't do it. You can't do it. This is impossible to uphold the law. And Paul actually kind of um, insinuates that if one tries to uphold the law, even if you try with all of your might, what you're actually doing is you're getting re-enslaved and you become a slave again to trying to uphold it. And Paul uses this word yoke. He says the yoke of slavery. And he uses this to illustrate a point. Now, what is a yoke? Um, A yoke isn't something that we're too, at least I'm not too familiar with a yoke. You're probably not as familiar with it either. Uh, A yoke is really just a wooden uh, cross piece that's used to control domesticated animals. Um, You you would fasten this uh, yoke to the neck of two animals and you would attach it to a plow or a cart and it'd do your heavy lifting for you. It'd get a lot of the work done. Um, But there are other types of yokes too. This is one that you would use with animals, but there's actually uh, a yoke that humans would use. And I actually have a yoke here and I want to call up my good friend. Will you guys give a round of applause for my good friend, Matt? Matt, come on up. So Matt is a seventh grader. Uh, He's actually the winner of the costume party from the Bassam costume party on Friday night. So I just thought I'd throw that out while he's coming up here. So Matt, come on over here. I've got this yoke that I purchased on eBay. I don't have animals at my house or a farm or anything. Um, but uh, anybody ever seen one of these before? Anybody ever seen a yoke before? Randy, I'm sure you've probably seen one before. You, 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 gr- you grew up on a farm. So this is a yoke, uh, and this is what's called a milkmaid yoke, a milkmaid yoke, different from what we saw earlier on the picture, but this is a milkmaid yoke. And, and Paul is talking about this yoke of slavery. And uh, a yoke is really, it's, it's, it's a tool that's used to carry burdens, to carry heavy weights or to carry, to, to carry loads. And uh, can you imagine using a crude piece of equipment like this? I mean, for me, I get frustrated when my Wi-Fi is a little bit slow. I couldn't imagine like lugging this thing around uh, all day. Uh, but what Paul is trying to do is Paul is trying to say, you know, don't go back to wearing a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to doing it. You know, it is fine if... Um, 
if, you, if you're using this yoke to carry a, a load like on a farm or to do work, it's fine to, to, to wear that, to put this on, and perhaps uh, you're carrying whatever you're carrying. And when the job is done, when the chore is over, you take this yoke off and you put it down, you go about the rest of your day. But it would be foolish if at the end of your chore, at the end of your job, you still wore this yoke for the rest of the day. Like you got in your car, you went to bed at night, or you ate at the table with this. That would be foolish. And Paul says the same thing about, to the, to the Galatians and to us, that, you know, before you found Jesus, before you found salvation, you were trying probably, like most people, to earn your way to heaven. You were probably trying a bunch of, to follow a bunch of do's and a bunch of don'ts. And you were carrying this heavy load, trying to earn your way to heaven, trying to avoid hell. You were, you know, watching your language and watching what you were, you know, talking about and being careful of what you saw on TV. And you were doing a lot of forms and, 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 and forms of religion and so on and so forth. But then when you met Jesus, you were given this freedom. You were freed up from carrying this heavy load. And Paul says to the Galatians, how foolish it would be if even after you found salvation in Jesus, you still went around carrying all these do's and don'ts. You were still trying to add something to the salvation that Jesus had died to give you. You were still trying to add and carry the load of all this religious stuff. And you weren't embracing the freedom that God had given you. And, and Paul says, you'd be foolish. It'd be absurd if you were trying to do that. Matt, um, how long do you think you could stay up here? As long as I, he, he, he says, he, I can stay up here as long as you want, Pastor. Okay, so we're just going to have you stay right there, okay? Can you stand there while I finish the rest of my lesson? At any point, if you feel faint or lightheaded, keep standing there because it's, it'll mess me up for my talk. Now, actually, if, if you start to feel tired, sit down. Um, but here's the deal. Paul goes on in verse 3, and he gets real specific, talking about one, one of these laws, kind of these forms of, of Jewish religion. Uh, he's he talks about circumcision. He talks about this multiple times um, in verses 2 through 6. He says this, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law, you are severed from Christ, kind of ironic word choice. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the spirit by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. See, to the Jews, circumcision and observing the Sabbath were huge. They were everything to the Jewish people. So what Paul, he's kind of using circumcision to kind of summarize all of the law. And he put, kind of dumps that all in his use of the word circumcision. What he's basically saying is here, if you think that practicing circumcision uh, makes you right with God, if you think that following this Jewish custom uh, makes you better and, and it, it it's added to the salvation that Jesus died to give you on the cross, then what you really need to do is you really need to follow not just circumcision, you need to follow every law. Don't just stop short with circumcision. You need to be following all the Jewish laws. You need to be perfect. If, if that's your mindset, don't just follow one law. You're required to follow all of them, even the law of circumcision. Now, when it comes to circumcision, yikes, who wants to sign up for that? Um, a friend of mine knew that I was talking uh, about this and was in, in, in this portion of scripture. And he sent me this graphic and he was like, hey, just in case anybody at your church really wants to be like the Judaizers, um, perhaps you could offer this at your church. And so we have these kits for sale in the lobby after church today. If any of the guys out there want to purchase them um, and make sure you're following the whole law. But uh, take, take that down. <laughs> uh, so Paul goes on to encourage the Galatians and he acknowledges their past progress. He acknowledges the fact that they once were in darkness, now they're in light. So he acknowledges that progress. But then he also questions how and why they strayed from the gospel. They had this freedom, but now they're going back to wearing the yoke again with all the, the do's and the don'ts. Uh, and he says to them in verse seven, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Then he turns his attentions to the, to the Judaizers and the false teachers. And in verse 8, he says, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. And he's kind of pointing back and saying, why are you following these guys? It's Jesus who called you. 
And then he warns about the dangers of how false teaching can come into a church, can come into a body. And he, 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 he again uses this other word picture of, of leaven. And he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he's saying like, if a few of you start to follow this and believe this false ideology, this false uh, teaching that it's about do's and don'ts in addition to Jesus, well, that could sweep through the whole body. And you have to purge that and get that out. And he tells the, them that the false teachers are going to be judged for bringing this in and adding this to the true gospel. In verse 10, he says, I have, con- uh, have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. And then finally, he instructs them uh, that the false teachers are to be cut off and removed from outside the body. In verse 12, he says, I wish those uh, who unsettled you were emasculated themselves. It gets really specific and really guarding the true essence of the gospel. Now let's focus on the second part of the big idea. The gospel eats away at the motivation to sin. Again, the first half was the gospel, that gospel freedom takes away the guilt of sin, but gospel freedom also eats away at the motivation to sin. So this addresses, again, this incorrect mindset that uh, because of Christ, because of the freedom that we have in him, we actually have freedom to do whatever we want, to live however we would like to live. And and it doesn't matter if we sin because Jesus died and he'll just wipe that away. No big deal. Paul wraps up this portion of Galatians 5 by talking about what is the true motivation. In verse 13, he says, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, when Paul says here, an opportunity for the flesh, what he means is, again, don't let your freedom become a stumbling block to you. Don't let this, uh, this freedom uh, from the law be a springboard to living an unchecked life of sin. And many were doing that. And perhaps some of us even here today have thought that in the past. Well, it's no big deal if I watch this or say this or do this or don't do that. Because, you know, Jesus died for me, no big deal. And Paul's saying that is false. That's false. If we abuse our freedom in Jesus, again, we'll end right back up. We're in the yoke of slavery. So Paul's warning, saying, don't go back there. Don't go back there. Paul was preaching that Jesus gave us freedom so that we don't have to live uh, under the law. But he's also warning us and telling us it doesn't give you freedom to live outside the law and just do whatever you want and live whatever lifestyle you want to live as well. And there's a difference. And that difference is where we're going to wrap up this morning. The application in all of this is a paradox. I know, I don't like paradoxes either. But that's what Paul does here in these 15 verses. He actually gives us a paradox as our application. While Jesus uh, died to provide gospel freedom that allows us to take off the yoke of slavery, to lift this yoke off of us and put down this, these do's and don'ts, the same gospel, it does obligate us to fulfill the law. So you see that? So Jesus died so that we didn't have to carry around these do's and don'ts of the law, but that same freedom in the gospel, it still obligates us to fulfill the law. And that might sound like a contradiction, but stay with me just another minute. Because this uh, gospel freedom is talked about in verse 14. He says, For the whole law is filled in one word, you shall, love the Lord, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul is quoting Jesus here. And Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament, Moses. And Jesus summarizes the entire law of Moses in Matthew 22, 26 through 40. And Matthew says this, Teacher, a man asks Jesus, um, which is the greatest law, uh, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he, Jesus, says to the man, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You see, what Paul was telling the Galatians and what God is telling you and me here today is that uh, now that uh, Jesus has removed this heavy weight, he's removed the yoke, he's removed the burden of our sin, that actually makes us want to strive even more to get closer to God. It makes us want to, uh, it gives us even more reason to love him. It gives us even more reason to worship him. It gives us even more reason 
to respond to him because the yoke has been removed. Again, gospel freedom takes away the guilt of sin. But here's the deal. When you, when you feel guilty, when you feel ashamed, when you feel condemned, those feelings, they don't make you want to run to Jesus, typically. Guilt, shame, condemnation, remember in the garden with Adam and Eve, that did not make them want to run towards God. Guilt, shame, and condemnation typically make us want to run away from God. So when Jesus removes the guilt, as Paul told, told us in Romans 8, when he removes that condemnation, we're freed up to now run towards Jesus in response to him. That's why we worship this morning. That's why we gather together. That's why we spend time in God's word, in fellowship, in prayer, because we want to respond even more to a God that has lifted this heavy load off of us. And so out of that is an overflow of not only a, a desire to get closer to God, but an overflow of that love spills out to the people around us. So that's why we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. So the freedom found only in the gospel gives us a greater desire to love God more fully, but there's also an outflow to love those around us. So here's my challenge to all of us today. I wanna challenge all of us to move towards one of three things this week. So don't try to do all three unless you're a super Christian. Typically trying to do too many things, that's a heavy burden in itself. But I wanna challenge you to do one of these three things that we're gonna go over this week, this week. And the first one is this. If you haven't already done so, consider asking Jesus into your heart. Consider asking Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Consider asking Jesus to help you, to allow you to lift off all of the condemnation, all of your sin, all of your past, to put it aside so that you can live a new life in Jesus and you can get a total fresh start, a redo in your life. That would be number one. Consider, if you haven't done so already, asking Jesus to come into your life, forgive your sins, give you a fresh start and a totally new beginning. Number two, consider sitting down and making a list of all your do's and don'ts. Everything that's been in your buckets up here, all the do's and don'ts that uh, could possibly be in your life. And I want you to examine this list and see if any of these have become a yoke of slavery to you. See if any of them have been something that has maybe, um, it's competing with Jesus. It's maybe even trying to replace the true salvation that we find in Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that the do's and don'ts are necessarily wrong, but I'm saying sometimes these things in our life, they become a form of godliness. They, be, they become religious uh, distractions that uh, uh, take the place of the salvation that Jesus died for. And if you find anything on your list and you're thinking, you know what, that, that could be this one thing on my list. It could be pulling me back into slavery that Paul warned about then I would just encourage you to begin praying about that and saying, God, how would you have me respond to this? How would you have me to deal with this? I think that this is competing with the salvation and the freedom that you died to give me. And I don't want anything to compete with that. I want that to be what gives me freedom, not my do's and don'ts. And then the third thing is I want you to think about who God has put right in front of you, right in your world, right in your sphere of influence that you need to love and or serve better. Think about somebody in your family that you work with, a neighbor, somebody in your life that God has put right in front of you that you need to love or serve better. And as you love and as you serve that person, I wanna challenge you to watch what God does in your life. Watch how God begins to change you. Watch how as you respond back to God, watch what God begins to do in your life. Gospel freedom takes away the guilt of our sins and it eats away at our motivation to sin. So I want you to imagine your life living it in total gospel freedom. Imagine that, just total gospel freedom in your life. No longer looking like how ridiculous Matt looks up here carrying these two buckets. But imagine, Matt, go ahead and actually take that off and set that down and you can have a seat. Give him a round of applause for helping out. Imagine you doing that in your life, you, you take off that yoke of freedom. You totally live in the gospel freedom that Jesus died to give you. Imagine no longer having to carry the weight of all those do's and don'ts around with you. Imagine just 
letting go, just totally focusing on Jesus, making him number one in your life, letting him lead you, letting him guide you. All you have to do is just sit back and relax in this freedom that Jesus died to give you. What you'll see is a renewed passion for Jesus in your life. And what you'll see is a greater compassion in your heart for the people around you. Doesn't that sound like such a better way to live? Doesn't that sound like such a more blessed way to live than living in the slavery of carrying around this yoke with you? Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you for the freedom that we have in Jesus. And I thank you that you've taken away the guilt of sin and how your love for us eats away at our motivation to sin. And we ask that you help us to tear off the yokes that have enslaved us from our past. And we ask that we would learn to walk in the total freedom that can only be found in a relationship with you. We thank you for that. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Just pause for a moment. We're going to continue in just a time of communion. And uh, the Bible tells us that uh, communion is for the body of of, of believers. Uh, It's for followers of Jesus. Uh, if you find yourself sitting here today and you're like, well, that, that's not me. I'm not a follower of Jesus. Well, that's totally okay. I just invite you to sit back and just watch how people that call themselves followers of Jesus just continue in another form of worship, which is communion. And communion is just, uh, it's another word picture. It's another object lesson that Jesus gave his followers um, as a way to remember. Sometimes we have trouble remembering things, even important things. And so Jesus gives us this object lesson of uh, juice and bread. Uh, And he gives us those and says, do them periodically. And as often as you do, remember my death for you. So uh, you should have, when you got, uh, when you came in this morning, uh, our elements, our bread and our juice. If you didn't get one of those, if you'll just slip your hand up, an usher is going to come around and he'll provide you.